each lecture and activity on time, regardless of the number of participants. Five, we encourage all participants interested in a particular mini course to attend all lectures and activities associated with that mini course to get the most out of it. With that being said, we're very excited to have uh, Radhika speaking on OTFN. So whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. And thank you, organizers, for organizing this awesome conference and inviting me to speak here. So I want to tell you about automorphisms of free groups. Um, so let's just start with what is a free group? So a free group on ungenerators, like, uh, let's see. So this is a presentation which you would have seen. I like to think of the free group as the fundamental group of this geometric, of the space, of this wedge of n circles. Um, then I will, throughout my lecture, I will be think, focusing on this picture. Free group for me would be the fundamental group of this rose. Um, since you saw surfaces last week, um, just a quick reminder that like, a, like this surface with one boundary component, like this particular one with one genus and one boundary, it's a fundamental group is actually free group on two generators. And the way to check this, you can, you can check this later, but the way to see this is, so you have your torus with identifications. And then if you punch a hole that gives you your boundary, your boundary curve, and then like actually um, their surface deformation retracts just onto the boundary thing, which is which gives you this um, this rose. Um, so yeah, you can sometimes you can think of uh, surfaces when you're thinking of free groups, not but not always. Um, okay, so free groups are I guess the most basic group. Every group you can impose relations on a free group and get every group you like. Um, so to understand free groups, we want to understand their group of symmetries. That's like the usual principle of, if you want to understand this object, you want to know its symmetries. So the group of automorphisms of the free group is the group of symmetries, of that group. Um, some examples of automorphisms. So I have to, so I'm thinking of free group on two generators. I have to send, I have to send a basis to a basis. Um, and then my first example, I'm just conjugating both A and B by the same element G. Um, and here you can check it's, it's for rank two, it's not for these simple examples, it's not too bad to check that this is an automorphism. My second example is A goes to A, B goes to AB. This is also a basis. Um, third example is, um, let's see, I've just switched the order. So A goes to A, but B goes to BA. So it's going to BA here, here it was going to AB. And the fourth example is slightly more complicated. Um, so these are some examples of automorphisms. There are certain automorphisms which are special. These are called inner automorphisms. Um, so these are the ones, oops, um, like these automorphisms are just when you conjugate your, say F1 is an example, when you just conjugate by some group element. So this group is actually, that group of inner automorphisms is actually isomorphic to the free group itself. Um, since, since we are trying to understand the group of automorphisms and the inner, this subgroup is the same as the free group, we often conjugate by that and look at the outer auto, group of outer automorphisms. So this is the group I'll be interested in throughout this mini course, group of outer automorphisms of the free group. Um, some examples. Oh yeah, we should, let's see. Um, because this is a quotient group, so I have my example F1. Because I'm quotienting out by inner automorphisms, it's actually trivial in my outer automorphism group. These square brackets mean the equivalence or like the class of F1. Um, the automorphism, so like let's see, F2 and F3, they look pretty similar. Here it was AB, here it's BA. So what's going on is I've just composed by a conjugate by B bar. That's the difference between F2 and F3. And since they differ by an inner automorphism, they are again, they're the same outer automorphism. Um, okay. Um, okay, so, so the philosophy I was selling to you was like, okay, I want to understand this object free group, then I want to understand its automorphisms. Then what about the automorphisms of the automorphisms? Like what about that group? Like maybe I want to understand that. 
But thankfully, Wrightson and Wortman showed that you don't have to like, you don't have to keep infinitely keep doing this where you keep taking odds and outs. You can stop and just like study one, one out or one odd. So this is, yeah, this is really cool. Um, that if you take out of out fn, then that's that's just the identity proof. So you don't have to worry about going multiple levels up. Um, so again, we'll focus on just out fn, group of outer automorphisms. Um, so here is a little little thing like so like assume you know everything about a circle. So circle is a compact one manifold with non-trivial fundamental groups. It's the simple like it's the simplest such matter. It's the only I guess manifold like this. Um, so then you want to move. So let's suppose you know everything about this this manifold, everything you might want to know in the world. So what's like the next step you might want to explore? So these are like some things I thought I think are interesting. You can go to compact two manifolds, that's surfaces, which you've been, again, Marissa was telling you all about surfaces last time. Um, instead of one circle, you could look at products of circles, then you get torus. Um, this is a two torus. In general, you can look at n torus, or you can look at wedge of circles. That's like the free group. The fundamental group of this thing is a free group. And the group of symmetries, respectively, are mapping class group, then SLNZ, and out of n. So these, and in fact, um, in, in lower rank, in just like if I'm just looking at SL2, if I'm just looking at the torus or the surface with um, genus one surface with one boundary and like free group of rank two, all these groups are actually isomorphic. Um, so this is like the group of matrices, mapping class group, out of N, they're all the same in lower rank. But in higher ranks, they're very different. And But the idea is that you, because of like this similarity, you try to understand, I guess people, people started understanding, people started studying linear groups first because these are matrices and they're like, much more approachable than like other things. Then mapping class groups, people started to mimic what they did for linear groups to study mapping class groups to, to an extent. Mm -hmm. And then for out of n, people mimic what's been done for mapping class groups. Um, so that's a, so that's, it's easy to ask a lot of good questions for about this group, about out of n, but it's very hard to answer those questions often. And hopefully I can, can give you some sense for why those, why it's hard to answer those questions. Asking the question is easy because you can be like, oh, this is true for mapping class group. Is this true for out of N? Um, that's like, you can you can start thinking like that. Um, and the example I have written here is, I guess these are just examples of some some elements. So you saw what are pseudo Nosovs. Pseudo Nosovs, I guess in this setting, they, they basically behave like these irreducible matrices. Um, and an example of an like corresponding free group automorphism here is this A goes to AB, B goes to BAB. Um, we'll give we'll give this automorphism a special name later on. Um, okay, so before I like actually start telling you about specific techniques, I wanted to draw a timeline because um, I also found this helpful while I was making it because I was like, okay, like what are the things people have proved about this group and like what's going on? What are people proving right now? So let's quickly go through. We don't have to really know with the words I use here, this is just to give you some sense for the activity that's been happening uh, like to study this group. So Nielsen, um, I guess the first, like initially Nielsen started studying out of N and he showed that it's finally presented uh, in 1924. Then Magnus showed that the kernel of, so again, because we know so much about linear groups, it was natural to study the kernel of this map and he showed that this is finitely presented. Whitehead started using, he started using three manifolds to study the free group. Um, so I, yeah, I think if you take connect sum of S1 cross S2, if you take N connect sum, then the fundamental group of this guy is Fn. So you can, you can check this later if you haven't thought about this before. Um, and then Whitehead used his three manifold stuff to give algorithms for different things. like somebody hands you some words, uh, no, somebody hands you a word. This, might, this question might not make sense right now, but I'll say it still in case you know these words. If somebody gives you a free group element to check whether it's primitive or not, um, or if it's a free factor or not. But these, and these algorithms are like, they are super cool. Um, then one of my favorite things about working with 
like out of n is this is Stallings. Um, Stallings has this amazing paper. It's like super accessible. It's called Topology of Finite Graphs. Let me take that. Um, you really don't need any background to read that paper. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just beautiful. Um, so he talks about graph folding. Um, and that was, that's like one of, it's a really useful tool which shows up in out of and like all over the place. So yeah, the goal for today would be to actually talk about folding of graphs. Um, then sort of a big bang kind of event for the study of outer space, uh, sorry, out of N was the def uh, color and Wortman defined this thing called outer space. So what is outer space? It's like type Muller space. So mapping class group acts on type Muller space. Um, SLNZ acts on symmetric space. Outer space basically is the same, it's the analog. So once this space came into existence, like there was just like a boom in what people could prove about this group. Um, so we'll talk about outer space tomorrow. So I'll define what outer space is. I'll tell you what Color and Wortman proved about out of N using this space. Um, initially they were, they were interested in homological questions about out of N, but then now it's been used to do a lot more stuff. It's like the type Muller space, oops. Um, then, okay, then people studied, Bestwina and Paula studied separately the boundary of the space and something called R trees shows up. So these are like fuzzy, hairy trees. So I won't have time to talk about R trees, but they also are, I should highlight this. Um, they are, um, they are a very important tool in the, like in the study of out of N. Um, then another like super awesome thing was this train tracks. So again, Thurston had defined train tracks for um, mapping class group elements and Bestvina and Handel, um, yeah, they, they use Thurston's ideas to define train tracks for outer automorphisms. And the way I think of train tracks is it's a way of doing linear algebra. Like you like linear algebra so much, um, you want to do it, but for free groups, you can't do it directly, but via train tracks, you can really use the power of train, uh, linear algebra to solve, simplify your problems. Even Thurston's train tracks do that. Like uh, if, yeah, you must have seen a pseudo in our last time. It's a pretty complicated uh, surface homeomorphism, but using train tracks, it literally boils down to linear algebra. So that's really cool. Um, then there was, um, there was something called, there's something on laminations. Let's not worry what it is but it was used to prove the teeth alternative. So out of N satisfies the teeth alternative, which says that the, um, sorry, that every subgroup either contains a free group or it's virtually abelian. I think it's, no, it's virtually null potent. I'm forgetting, somebody should correct me. Um, okay. Um, Okay, let's skip some things. Um, so I want to focus on Lipschitz metric. So, so outer space was defined by Color and Wortman in 1986. Uh, and then in 2008, Franco Vigli and Martino, they defined a metric on the space. So before that, there was no metric and it was just a topological space where you could do homological stuff, but they, they defined a metric and then you could do a lot more stuff uh, using this metric. Um, then the subgroup classification is also quite important. We'll not, we'll not talk about this. We will also not talk about Lipschitz metric. Um, then there was, there was like these, I guess I should, we should all be like around the same time. Um, so there, the, the curve complex, which I'm very sure you heard a lot about last week. It's like this awesome, awesome hyperbolic space. Um, so there was free factor complex had been defined earlier. But in 2011, Pestvina and Fain showed that it's delta hyperbolic. And that was, like, everyone was like super happy. Okay, we have this hyperbolic space our group is acting on. So like, yeah, we can do lots of stuff. But then like more the better, um, people were able to prove two other complexes were also hyperbolic. So we, for out of N, we have lots of hyperbolic complexes. Um, then no single of them has, is like as good as the curve complex yet. Uh, there's a lot unknown. And in the last lecture, I want to tell you what these complexes are and what kind of questions people think about 
for these complexes. Um, and yeah, these were just like some recent results, but there's like a lot more, which is technical, so I didn't add it to the timeline. Um, so the goal will be to talk about Stallings folds today, uh, outer space tomorrow, and hyperbolic complexes on the last day. So I guess I said a lot of new words very fast <laughs> right now, probably. But are there any questions? OK, so let's do some simple, simple things now. So here is a question. I give so free group. My three generators are A, B, and C. I give you three words, A, B, B, C, and C, and I ask you, is that a basis? What does it mean to ask, is it a basis? That means, can I use these three words to, to get back A, B, and C? So here you can, you'll be like, of course, like I can do a little bit of algebra and then I, I can get A, B, and C. So I can take B, C and then multiply it by C bar. And then I have B. Once I have B, I can do A, B dot B bar. And then I have A and C I already had. So yes, that's a basis. Because using these, these three words, I can construct A, B, and C. Um, OK, what about the next example? The words are slightly more complicated. Um, I literally randomly wrote them. Um, so you could try doing some algebra. And I think it's not, I think it's not a basis. But if I give you like really long words, if I give you three like 100 length 100 words, then it's very tedious to do that algebra of just like trying to see where can I cancel stuff and how, how will I like recover A, B, and C. So um, a geometric way of doing this is doing Stallings folds. So what is a fold? So I start with a graph, a oriented labeled graph. And for a, a graph for me is a finite one dimensional cell complex. And I have two moves, which I call folds. If I have two edges, which have the same label and the same orientation joined at a vertex, I just like literally fold them. Um, that's my folding operation. And another folding operation, just like another picture is here. Like one of my edges is actually a loop. And then I fold those two, like I, I have a loop and an edge and I just like wrap it around. So those are my two fold moves. How do I use this to check if something is a basis or not? So I have these three words. I start with three loops labeled by these three words. So I have A, B, then I have B, C, and I have C. So these are loops. My loops are labeled by these three words. And now I have, now I have to do folding. Uh, folding is basically a geometric way of keeping track of all the cancellations. So I see, oops, it's too big. I see that I have this edge. I can fold these two together um, to get, so nothing happens to the first loop. That stays A, B. This one, now the C, now this edge is basically folded over, so it's gone. And I have C here. Um, I can fold again, because I again see I have B here, and I have B here. So I can fold again. And here, now I'm only left with A and left with B and C. Um, so that's how, if you, so basically the point is, if you like start with your three your rows with petals labeled by your words. And if you fold, 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 and if you are able to get A, B, and C, then that means what you started with is a basis. And I'm actually just canceling stuff. Like when I folded, the fo when I did the first fold, I took away the C from B, C. That was the very first step I did here, taking away the C from B, C. So folding is literally the cancellation stuff, but doing it geometrically. Um, so now if I give you complicated words, then you can just like, you can start drawing pictures instead of racking your brains with the algebra. Um, so that's a very basic basic thing you can do at Stallings Folds. Uh, 
Um, okay. Um, some definitions. A map of graphs is what you think it should be. It should send vertices to vertices, edges to edges, preserving the structure. And I would say such a thing is an immersion if it's locally injective. So here is an example. Um, so I have this graph map where I'm sending E1 to AB. So this loop is mapping to AB. E2 is mapping to BC. E3 is mapping to C. And another way of representing this is like this loop E1 was mapping to AB. So I label it like this. Um, E2 was mapping to BC. So that's just a way of writing what the map was. And E3 goes to C. And this, this map is not an immersion because the end of E2 and the end of E3 are actually mapping to the same, same place C. This is what we were seeing here. Like this is mapping to C and this is also mapping to C. I guess, I guess I should say C bar. I should say this is C bar and this is C bar. Um, so this map is not an immersion. Um, so what Stallings, Stallings theorem says that every time you have a map of graphs, it factors through, you can basically fold, 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 fold to get an immersion. Um, folding gives you an immersion. That's that's the result. That's um, Radhika, I think we have a question. Oh yeah. So, uh, what if instead of the second loop being labeled B C, what if it were? Uh, oh, never mind. That's not a good question. Um, I, I guess do, where where does the orientations come into it? Is I guess my question. Like, can I fold whenever I see two C's together, or do the orientations on the two different C's have to like match up in some way? The orientations have to match up. Yeah. So when I am folding, it's like I'm folding oriented labeled graphs. The orientations have to match up. Thank you. Yeah, so here it's important that this C is pointing in. Um, this is also pointing in. Yeah. Um, OK, so now I just want to do some applications of folding. Uh, you can do really cool stuff with folding. Um, so let's see. So here's the first question. Um, you are given some words in the free group, and you consider the subgroup generated by those free group by those words, and I want to find a basis for that subgroup. So I might give you hundred words, and I would say find a basis or tell me the rank of this subgroup. Now you don't know. Like again, algebraically, it's very hard to know which word is redundant and which one's not. So you want to find a basis for this thing. Um, 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 sorry, we have a request. Can you go back uh, to, for a second to the Stallings theorem? Uh, yes. Oops. Um, yeah, I don't know. Alberto, do you have a specific question about Stallings theorem? Because you requested that. Are the but... slides on the website yet? Sorry? No. Never mind. That's a question for myself. No, but the video is uh, being streamed. So. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah, I think we're good now. Thanks. Well, thanks, uh, Radhika. Okay, so, is the, so the question is, I hand you 100 words and I say, find the subgroup. Well, okay, what do I mean? Find a basis for the subgroup or like basically tell me the rank of the subgroup. There are two different questions. And so I want to say, I want to show you how that's like easy. It's like super simple to do using Stallings, um, Stallings folding. So I have my free group on two letters. I have the subgroup generated by these three words. So I want to start by, again, since I have three words, I start with three, I should draw them bigger. Um, So Stallings folding is basically like canceling stuff. So, so my first loop is A cube, B, A, 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 B. Second one is A bar. So I'm going to draw it like pointing 
in the opposite direction. So A bar, B, A, oops, A, B, and the third one is A square, B bar. So let me again draw it in the opposite direction and then A. Um, since I'm just trying to like find, like do cancellations algebraically, I start doing Stallings folding. Um, so I have to look for places where I can fold. Um, let's see, so I can fold. So I have this, this A and this A are oriented in the same fashion. Then I have, let's see, I have more stuff. I have this A and this A. So I can do, okay, this is something to think about. I can do these foldings one at a time or I can do them all together. Um, it won't matter. It's like, yeah, you can do cancellations one at a time or at the same time, it shouldn't matter. So I'm going to do it at the same time. Um, and then can I fold some more stuff? Um, a bar B, A, B. Oh yes, I can fold more stuff. I can fold this B is pointing in and this B is also pointing in. So I can also fold those. So let's see. Um, so, I, so I'm doing three folds at the same time. Let's see if we can, if I can draw it properly. Um, I think should be something. So let's see, I have yellow fold, a purple fold and a green one. Purple one is A coming in, yellow one is B coming in and the green one is A going out. Um, okay, I'm not doing it in the most efficient. I might do some mistake. Let's see. Okay, purple and purple and green. No, green and yellow. So I have I have A A Q B. So that's like my first loop, and then I have A bar B A. Oops, no. Okay, A bar, B, A, B. And the last one is A square, B bar, A. Okay. Um, Then I can do more folds. Let's see. So here I can do these two Bs. I can do, so maybe now it's best to do one, one at a time because I think it can get, it can get a little crazy to start folding everything at the same time. But I can do this together. And I think that's it. But let me just show you what's the end result. Um, So this is something you should definitely, there, there is an example in the exercises which you should try. Um, but what ends, yeah, eventually you end up with just this rank two graph, this theta graph of rank two. So even though I gave you three generators, this is actually just a rank two subgroup. Um, and maybe we should quickly read, read the words to make sure we have all three words. Um, so I have, I have A cube B, that's A cube B, I have, a bar B, A B, and I have A square B bar A. So I do have all three, all three words. So I didn't do anything. I didn't do something super wrong. At least I have those three elements. So this this subgroup is actually generated by just these. So okay, now I have a theta graph, and to choose a basis for this theta graph, like I can see three loops here, um, but it's a rank two graph, so I can choose any two loops to be my basis, so I just chose two. So the subgroup is a rank two subgroup. So by doing this folding process, 
you can figure out a basis for the subgroup and a generating and a generating sub sorry and the rank of the subgroup any questions about this yeah so this is like an if and only if statement as soon as you you can't fold anymore it means you have the right rank um, is that okay thanks yeah so we have a question in the chat uh, it says, can you know if it's a finite index with this representation based on the folds? Thank you for asking that question because that's the next thing I want to talk about. Um, or maybe the second next thing, but it's, it's, it's getting there. Like that's the, that's where we are going. Um, so now I want, so okay, now I have my, so it's the same subgroup and I want to find a covering space for the rows corresponding to that subgroup. So I want a, I want a covering space whose fundamental group is H. So I, oops, so I'm going to start with, okay, so I should say, I need a space which is like locally injective or locally homeomorphic. So this is basically saying I need an emulsion. Um, and that's where I'm thinking, okay, I'll do Stallings folds. So the first, actually the first step would be, if I just gave you the subgroup H, I would start with these three loops. I would fold, 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 get this, um, this graph where I cannot fold anymore. And uh, I, have, I have this immersion. I can't fold anymore. So I have this map, but this is not a covering map yet because um, it's not locally injective or locally homeomorphic, I should say not locally homeomorphic. Um, so to make it into a cover, I have to add more stuff to it. But when I'm adding more stuff, I have to make sure I don't change the fundamental group because I want the fundamental group of my cover to be H. Um, so what I do is I add trees and I add trees just to, yeah, so that I can make everything locally homeomorphic. So if I look at my base point, I have, so, at this base point, I have like basically four edges, A coming in, going out, B coming in, going out. So I have to make sure that's true everywhere. So here I need just one extra, and then I need three everywhere. And then just like, it will have to continue. Um, and what would be the label of this thing? So A is I'm good with, A coming in, A going, A coming in, A going out, B coming in, I want B going out. And then you can fill in the rest. At this vertex, I have two. I need two more. And they have to be Bs. And then I have, then I start doing my, my tree. So here I have one. And this one is B going out. And here again, I have two. Here I have B coming in and A coming in. and so on. Um, so that's my covering space. I'm adding these trees because I don't want to change the fundamental group of the covering space. So the fundamental group of the space is, here's my base point. I see only these, like these fundamental group is just here. So this, um, the white graph, white subgraph, the thing which we got after our immersion is called the core, uh, core subgraph. Of, Either you can say of H or of the cover. Um, Just a, okay. a comment that you, I think you missed the vertex in the, in the center. Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> That's yeah, this is not a cover right now. <laughs> thank you very much. So I need two more here, um, A and B, yeah, perfect. Um, okay. Okay. So that was the, okay. So now we are at the question that was asked a couple of minutes ago. So now I want to find a finite index subgroup containing H or before I do that, just by looking at this covering diagram, is H a finite index subgroup? It's not a finite index subgroup because the covering, like the covering space has infinite valence. Yeah. Um, so this is so H is not a finite index subgroup. So now my question makes sense. Find a finite index subgroup containing it. 
um, so I'm think yeah. So here for me, finite. So when I say finite index subgroup, I'm thinking geometrically, and I'm thinking of a. I'm thinking, oh, I want a finite cover of the rows. That's what I'm thinking. Um, so what do I do now? I again start with the same immersion picture. And now, so earlier I wanted to make a cover with the same fundamental group, so I was adding trees. Now I don't. I'm 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 happy. I don't mind changing the fundamental group because I'm looking for a for a possible for a bigger subgroup containing my smaller subgroup. So what I will do now is I will try to again make a covering space, but I'm happy to increase the fundamental group. So to make it into a covering space again, I have to add. Oops, I have to add like similar edges. So I need, let's see, at least at each vertex, I need the right, the right number of edges. So I need B here. I need, uh, no, since I did this before, I'll do it. So that it looks slightly nice. Two here and one here, two here and two here. So this is B. Okay, let's fill this first. Here I need B going out. Um, here I need B going in and A going out. Here I need A coming in, B coming in, um, B going out, B coming in. So I've made sure that it's at least locally injective at each at each vertex. And now I will just uh, glue things. Uh, or I will just I will I will tie loose ends. I think that's the that's the right way to say this. I want to tie loose ends. I have too many loose ends and I want to tie them together. Um, how do I do that? So I have okay, this one's easy. I can just connect this here, and this one's also easy. Um, I have B going out, and I can tie it with this B coming in, and I can tie this one with this guy. Um, so now I have a covering space. This whole graph, it's a finite index subgroup because now it's finite valence. It's in fact index, let's count, one, two, three, four, five. It's index five. It's an index five subgroup. Um, it contains, contains H. Yeah, so how do I find, maybe I should have said this much, much earlier. How do I find the fundamental group of a, of a graph like this? Yeah. Now, so the way I find a fundamental group of a graph like this, it's okay, this is a complicated example. Um, let's do here. How do I find the fundamental group of this, th of this theta graph? I find a maximal, I have my base point. I find a maximal tree. I find, let's say this is my maximal tree. And then I read the labels for the other edges. So I go a square, and then I have to come back via the maximal tree. So I have a, a cube b, and then I have a bar b a b. Um, so here also I have my base point, and I would, I will find a maximal tree, and then I can find the fundamental group of this, of this whole graph, and that will contain that will contain h, and that's what I was looking for. I wanted a finite index subgroup containing H. Um, right. Any questions? Uh, there's a question. How do you find a maximal tree? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, so the definition of a maximal tree is like a tree that sees all the vertices. I don't know if they were asking for an algorithm, but anyway. <laughs> oh, oh, algorithm, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Radhika, couldn't I calculate, so are we asking about the, the fundamental group of this graph sort of by itself, or are we asking about it's like the image of its fundamental group inside the free group of rank two? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for asking that. Yes, because I, yeah. If I forget, 
if I forget that I have, let's, uh, let's do this. Yeah, if I forget, if I forget this map and the rows, then I have just this, like, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, rank six graph. It's a free group of rank six. And I like free group of rank six is just like free group of rank six. Um, I can call it A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or I can call it X, Y, Z, W, whatever I want. Um, but here I have, I have this map, which is an immersion. In fact, it's a covering map here. So when I when I'm talking about the fundamental group of this, of this top graph, I'm thinking of what's the fundamental group of this graph when I like embed it in the free group of rank two, generated by A and B. So could I, if I had a loop in this graph up here and I wanted to know what word it was downstairs, I could just read the label. Exactly. Yeah, thanks for asking, asking that question. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's why all these labels, that's what all these labels are doing. It's telling me how to read this, but even here, these labels are telling me how to read this rank two graph. Like this was a subgroup of F2, free group of two generators. So this graph is helping me read what is that subgroup in F2. Um, this is not just any F2. This is a free group of rank two sitting inside free, inside this free group of rank two. Okay. Here's the next question, which is the solution to this is this, this theorem called marshall Hall's theorem. Um, so now the question is, um, I'm given a group element G and I'm given a subgroup, which a subgroup does not contain G. Subgroup does not contain G. I want a finite index subgroup, which contains H. I know how to do that. We just did this, some subgroup containing H, but I don't want it to contain G. Okay. Um, so I guess the first, so the way I phrase this question, it's like, it's, I'm clearly saying it's possible. In general, it might not be possible for some groups. Um, okay, not all groups satisfy. It's, it, this, this question, there's no, yeah, there might not be an answer to this question for every group, but there are certain like special groups, which are called LERF, locally extendable residually finite. Um, I don't know what Ellie tells me, but residually finite is I think what I keep in mind. Um, but free group is it's like the simplest example, I feel, of a group which does give me a nice answer to this question, which does give me an answer to this question. Um, so let's try this. Let's see how to do this for, again, free group of rank two. I have G and I have H. So I've just taken a simple rank one subgroup just to do an easy example. Okay, so what's the process? So I want H to be in there, but I don't want G to be in there. So I don't want a loop for G, but I do want all the loops for H. So for H, I draw a loop. So there's only one loop here, which is A, B, and B. And for G, I do not want a loop. To make sure I don't get a loop, I just add an arc. A, B, A bar, B bar. So I flipped my arrows instead of writing A bar and B bar. Okay. Um, so I first fold because I eventually I want to do this construction where I first get an immersion, then I start like adding things to get a finite index subgroup. So let's fold to get the immersion to, to the rows um, on two petals. So what's what can I fold here? I can fold this A with this A. In fact, maybe let, let me just be greedy and fold further. So I'm, I'm again, I'm just jumping ahead and folding two things at the same time. I'm just being greedy. Um, so I fold these two guys and then I get, hmm. Let's see. Yes. 
I have A, B, and B, and then I have, so I have A, B, and then A bar, B bar. So now this is a, I can't do any more folds. So now I have my immersion. Okay. So now I can do my previous process of trying to get a finite index subgroup by um, by adding adding things. Uh, so to get a local homeomorphism, I need let's see, I need A, B, then I need A, B. Here I need only one, which is A. Here I need two, B and A, and here I need three. B, and then I have A and A. Um, and now I want to tie my loose ends. So now, right now it's a local homeomorphism, and I want to tie loose ends to get my finite index subgroup. Um, There might be more than one ways to do this. I should also say that, to tie these loose ends. Um, but I'm happy to find just one, one way of doing it. So I've done A, then okay, here's my B, B, A. Okay, so it's not pretty, but that's my, so now I have a finite cheated cover. So I have a finite index subgroup of my free group of rank two. And okay, what's the point? Um, I have my, okay, so here's my, here's my base point. So what were the conditions? I want, I want H to be a subgroup and I do have a loop for H. Oops. I do have a loop for H. I have A, B squared that loops there. So that, so H is part of this big subgroup for the whole corresponding to the whole graph. I did not want H, uh, I did not want G to be part of my subgroup. So I have to make sure that G is not a loop in this. So A, B, A bar, B bar, that's not a loop. And this is all, since I'm talking about like a particular G and a particular H, this is all base point dependent. Often like, yeah, Later, I will just like stop worrying about base points and do everything in terms of conjugacy classes. But right now, I'm talking about base pointed things. Um, so, so, so I'm happy. G is not in that subgroup. G is not a loop in there, and H is. H is a subgroup, and I have this finite index subgroup containing H but not G. Um, so, free group is, yeah, it's called. For, for residually finite. I mean, special, I guess it's more than residually finite. I think another word is separable, um, but this is a really, yeah. Um, so this is one of the main, main things, like Marshall Hall proved this like long time ago, but Stallings gave like a really simple, I mean, this is pretty, okay, I didn't prove anything. I just showed you how to do things. But when you, if you do read the proof, it's pretty simple. Um, if you believe in folding, then you're not doing much. Okay. So I have one I more. I do want to ask your question before we move on. Oh, yeah. I think we were, so we were seeing, we're walking, I guess, along the, the distinguished base point, and we're supposed to see A, B, A bar, B bar, but um, somehow we're seeing B bar, A bar, B, A. So could you just walk us through like seeing the A, B, A bar, B bar in like the, the each graph? Like seeing like where, where is the, the thing that's corresponding to the G, I guess is, is maybe would be helpful. Sorry, can you say that again? Like I got. Yeah. Can you like, can you just point out the base point and then like walk along the, the word for G? Oh, yes. Um. So this is my base point. So like when I started drawing my graph, this is my base point. Maybe I should. 
back to my pencil. Um, this is my base point. And then I was walking around like A, B squared, and then A, B, A bar, B bar. And then, so that's that's my base point. And I'm walking along, so H is A, B squared, and G is A, B, A bar, B bar. Cool, thank you. Awesome. So I have 10 more minutes, right? Okay, perfect. Yeah, you have 10 more Okay. Okay, so the last application I want to show you, like for stalling schools, is something called Housing's Theorem. Um, so, so, this, so here the question is, you're given two subgroups, H1 and H2, and the way you are, they are given to you is by a generating set, like X1, X2, XM, YM up to YM. And then you have to find the intersection. Um, and again, I'm talking about like actual subgroups and not conjugacy classes. So, and like you might ask, like, is the intersection of two finite index, sorry, is the intersection of two finite rank subgroups a finite rank subgroup? Um, so that's a question. Like Hausen's theorem says that that's true. Um, or even like, yeah, what is the intersection? Maybe that's the question. Um, so the way this is done is by something called a pullback, pullback graph. Um, so yes, yeah, I, I will show you the definition, but then I'll focus on the example and not really the definition. But the point is you like for H1, you, you get your core and then you have this immersion. For H2, again, you do Stallings folds to get your immersion. And then you like, you construct this pullback for this diagram. Um, so like again, like the white part is what you're given, then you can take the pullback of this white stuff is G naught, G1, like I guess this information such that it, it commutes. This side is same as this side. And it satisfies this universal property that you have any other thing. Riley, did you define this last week or no? No, no, right? Okay. Um, I said something category theoretic, but not this. Okay. <laughs> um, and so basically, I, okay, I should say what's the vertex set of G naught? You basically want a vertex in here to be something which like which maps to the same place in Rn. So it's a pair, u1 comma u2. Um, such that, okay, my U's became these, but such that F1 of U1 is the same as F2 of U2. Um, let's do an example. I think that's, that's much more helpful than seeing this. Um, okay, so again, I'm in free group of rank two. I have these two subgroups, H1 and H2. So my first step is to actually get those emergence um, since I, okay, I have five minutes, so I will not, um, so you should try to draw those emotions by yourself, but for H1, let's see, H1 is this rank two. So, okay, I don't know if it's rank two yet, just by looking at, well, this is simple enough. Uh, but for H1, I have this, this is my emotion. It's like I ended up folding, which I didn't show you how I did the folding, but I ended up folding because I have like, I have my A square and then I have my B, B, A. And for H2, again, I this is my emotion. It's labeled accordingly. Um, and I have, yeah, I should be careful with base points. So my, let's see, I have these fat green dots. Those are my base points. Um, okay. So let's first draw the vertex set. So I'm trying to draw the emotion with the pullback. Um, so the vertex set is, you look at a vertex in, let's just call, oops. so let's call this C1 and C2. So I want to look at pairs of vertices which map to the same point. Well, there's only one vertex in, in R2. So every pair shows up in, every pair shows up in G0. So I drew all the pairs, one X, one Y, 
1z, 1w, and so on. How do I find my edges? Um, let's see. So I have, okay, I have this, okay, I have a B edge from X to Y, and I have a B edge from two to one, just by, yeah, and both these edges are mapping to B here. So I'm looking at the edges which map to the same, uh, same thing in R2. So I have B from X to Y and B from two to one. So I have to draw B from two X to one Y. Um, from two X to one Y. Um, then I have, let's see, from Y to X, I have A. And I have A from one to two and from two to one. So I have the edge Y. Um, from Y to X. Um, this is A and this is A. So I'm trying to look at edges which are mapping to the same place in R2. That's what I'm trying to do. So that I, so that I can, um, and I want to do this for all the edges. So then I have B from Y to Z, but I have B from two to one. So I have to go from two Y to one Z. So two Y to one Z, that's B. Then I have to go from Z to W is B. So I have to go from two Z to one W. Two Z to one W, that's B. And I have W to Z. Um, is A, that's true for two to both one, two, like they have two of them. So W to Z, Let's see, W to Z is A, W to Z is A. Um, so that's pullback, it's some graph, it's not connected. Um, okay, but then I, since I was talking about the intersection of these two subgroups, um, okay, I, I guess it's part of the theorem that these two are also emulsions. So now if I look at, um, so okay, since I'm talking about subgroups, I have to be careful about base points. Um, so I have, I have this subgraph, like 2x is my base point. So this subgraph, which is like BA, that sits inside BA like maps in here as BA, and then it maps here as BA. BA also maps here as BA, sorry, BA, and that goes in here. Um, so with base pointed stuff, the intersection is just BA. And we could already actually, I mean, I chose this example was, BA was in the intersection was pretty clear from just by looking at the words I gave you. But is that the only thing was not obvious from the subgroups I gave you. But from this picture with this base point, that's the only, like, that's the fundamental group of the connected component with this guy. Um, and then you might be wondering, what about, what about this guy? Like this is also, um, this also has non-trivial fundamental group. So this is if basically if you change the base point, so you, you might be looking at a different conjugate of H1 or H2, and then you could be looking at the intersection. Uh, then you might get the other loop. Uh, so, okay, this was a, this was a cleaner picture <laughs> of what was happening. So the intersection is um, this thing. Okay, I think I'm done. Thank you. Yeah, let's, uh, thanks the speaker.